Alrighty guys, there they are. The brand new Lionel Legacy Brass Hybrids. On the left side, we have the Central Pacific Jupiter. On the right, we have the Union Pacific 119. Now, a little bit of background on the prototypes if you guys don't already know or you haven't checked YouTube and stuff like that. These were replicas built for the National Park Service by O'Connor Engineering out in Costa Mesa, California. Um, they are as close to the actual locomotives as they could possibly get. There weren't a lot of drawings or um, design blueprints or anything like that at the time. However, both locomotives are actually based off of the boiler and the firebox for the Union Pacific 119 because they happened to find a boiler blueprint with the locomotive's number on it. So they are actually both based off the 119. However, the 119 does have an extended smoke box and the Jupiter does not, as well as some other aesthetic features. As far as the paint and the artwork on these locomotives, when they were originally built for the National Park Service, they were very, very bright. If you guys have seen the prototype photos of the Leviathan, the Jupiter was painted almost identical to that. These new color schemes, I've heard some people kind of complain about them, that they're a little bit more muted and it's not accurate, but... Let's be honest, people, the photos are black and white. How can you possibly tell what the colors actually are? Lionel said that they actually did partner up with the Smithsonian and they actually went over more drawings and pictures and stuff like that. And they tried to get the colors much more accurate. To me personally, I think this is probably a lot closer. I mean, me, I do like the early turn of the century locomotives and the colors tend to be bright and vibrant. But these dull muted colors, I think, are a little bit more prototypical and I think they're going to work a little bit better. These locomotives also have a little bit of Disney history. And as you know, I am a big Disney guy. A lot of the custom locomotives that I do are Disney locomotives. Mr. Ward Kimball. actually did the artwork on the 119 and he did the gold leafing and all that stuff so technically it's a little part of Disney history so on to the models these models um, debuted or they were technically announced at the centennial of the Golden Spike the 150th anniversary um, by Lionel they are considered a brass hybrid however the entire locomotive is not all brass it is mostly die-cast metal most of the brass stuff that you guys will find is the stuff that technically looks brass. The piping, boiler bands, domes, stuff like that. It does not detract from them at all. I mean, if you didn't know any better, you would think that these things were entirely brass. When I first opened up the box, I was in shock, as I said before. Okay, so I just opened these things up and put them on the track. And holy God, Lionel. What? Like... These don't look like a model train. They're definitely not a toy train. These look like something that should be in a display case in the Smithsonian. Um, just the level of detail is incredible. The paint is stunning. I know there were some people that were complaining about the paint schemes and I um, do know that you guys did some more research on what the colors would be. I know it's kind of hard to tell in black and white photos, but personally me, I do like the new color schemes. I like the way they're a little bit more muted and not as bright, but Lionel, holy God, please do more stuff in this like era and time frame, please. I would love to see some freight cars, different passenger cars. I'd love to see a mogul. Um, even if you do like one a catalog or something like that, or one a year, they're just, they're incredible. They look wonderful as do the passenger cars. So sorry, I just wanted to put that in there guys, but onto the locomotive review. Um, they look like something that would be in a museum underneath the display case, not a model train. Now, both of these locomotives, the pros and cons. Um, the pros are the detail, the accuracy, the size, the, the artwork, the paint, it's all astonishing. The cons, there is no smoke, there is no sound in the locomotives. It's not a big deal to a lot of people. I know the O-Gagers were kind of spoiled. We do like our smoke and our sound. Um, but Lionel, it was a give and take for them. To have something small, scale, and accurate, they omitted certain things. They do have an LED headlight. Now, that doesn't rule you out for the sound. The locomotives have the option for sound. However, it is in the passenger cars. They are legacy equipped, both the passenger cars and the locomotive. However, they are sold separately. 
So if you were to buy the locomotives, you could absolutely run them with your legacy, your Bluetooth, or your Lion Chief um, remote. You just will not get sound. You will only have a headlight. They are extremely quiet when they run, so they don't make a lot of noise. I was expecting, honestly, some motor whining, and there was really nothing. Um, but they got the normal legacy features. They have whistle, quilling whistle, I should say, bell, tower comm chat, which these locomotives, there was no towers in the 1860s. Um, I'm assuming that it might be uh, chatter that would maybe go with the National Park Service when they're moving around out at the uh, National Historic Site. The headlights are a nice golden white LED that has your blow down, your water fill, everything. Um, the scale uh, four chuffs per revolution, they're just, they're astonishing. I'm not going to run them a whole lot. They're more of a collectible for me, but it is nice to know that if I take them to clubs, I can actually run them and they will work with my legacy system and I am thrilled about that. So now I'm going to bring you in for a closer look of the 119 and its passenger cars and then we will continue on to the Jupiter. Alrighty guys, here it is, the Union Pacific 119. So as locomotive, you're not going to be able to really appreciate everything unless you have these in your possession. But I will go over the basics. So you have your pilot slash cow catcher up front with a functioning um, draw bar. You have a magnetic opening boiler front, brass flagpoles, lighted LED headlight. The paint and artwork on this is just beautiful. They're so crisp. They're so clean. They look so great. Everything on this locomotive has pinstriping on it in one way or another. The drive wheels, I will actually show you guys a close-up of these drive wheels. There is pinstriping on the counterweights and on the spokes as well as the front of the pilot. The paint is a semi-gloss color. It actually is not super, super glossy and bright. It's kind of that happy medium and I personally like it. I was hoping these things weren't going to be super shiny and glossy because I thought that was going to take away from it a little bit, but they actually came out great. Moving along to the side of the locomotive, you have separately applied um, brass valves, crosshead pumps, brass steam cylinders, brass bell with the bell pole lanyard. And this is one of my favorite things on the 119 is the sand dome. The artwork of Jim Bridger and Johnny Appleseed, I believe it is, on the other side of the sand dome is just beautiful. Even the small detail work around the top looks great. The steam dome is actually turned brass, so that is turned brass. In fact, you can see some of the lathe marks in there. There is some small pinstriping on the base of the dome. The cab. This is really, really cool. Obviously, they're not wood. They're die cast. But the way that they printed the wood grain on the cab is awesome. It just looks so cool. It looks so realistic. You have a nice clean and crisp number 119 underneath the cab. And the cab windows do slide opened and closed. We have your tender. The tender lettering, Union Pacific Railroad, the 119, as well as the imitation gold leaf. Now, this is what a lot of people were complaining about on these models is the green color on the tender. They were saying that the 119 did not have this color, but like I said before, it's very difficult to tell because back in the day, it was all black and white photos. You can't really tell. I do realize that if you are a, you know, experienced person in the field of old photographs, you can decipher what shades of grays and stuff like that will turn out to be in certain photographs and I think they did their best. And like I said, I personally do like the new colors. Beautiful red painted wheels, trucks, some more gold leaf and pinstriping here. All the graphics on the tender of the 119, they're all beautiful. Um, I can't say that word enough, honestly. These things, I'm still in shock with them with how nice they look. But you have all your artwork on the corners of the tender as on the prototype. And now we're gonna go in for a look at the cab. Alrighty guys, this is the cab of the 119. As you can tell, it's very well detailed for how small these locomotives are. You really don't have an appreciation for how small these are unless you were to put them next to a Lionel General. They are significantly smaller, but they're scale models. So in real life, these turn of the century locomotives, these were much smaller than what you would see nowadays. So in the cab you're going to see you have a Johnson bar here you have it's going to be kind of hard for me to get to everything here back the passenger cars up a little bit 
you have your throttle. Um, up on the top, you actually have some white painted gauges. And this big hump down here, I'm guessing that's probably the drive gear for the drive wheels. Um, I know they couldn't do much with it. There's only so much you can do to hide everything, but it's not too bad. You can't really see into the cab very well anyway when the tender because when the tender's coupled to it because it is a close coupling and they are Lincoln pin and I'm going to show you guys that when we look at the rear of the tender so you can actually see what I'm talking about. But as you notice, all the printing goes up and down the sides of the cab. It's all very, very crisp, very, very clean, looks really great. It has the cab window glass, quote unquote, inserts in the cab, as well as some brass uh, grab rails on either side of the cab. Alrighty guys, now here's the back of the tender for the 119. As you can tell, like I said earlier, the artwork looks really, really good, very, very detailed. A nice crisp 119 and then back here is the coupler attachment for the Lincoln pin couplers yes ladies and gentlemen this has Lincoln pin it is not knuckle couplers however Lionel does say that you can convert them to scale knuckle couplers but I don't know a whole lot of people that are gonna do it but I'm sure there will be some that will this is what you attach them with I don't know if you're even gonna be able to see this this is a small pin for Lincoln pin couplers. I find the easiest way to couple the things is to use a pair of tweezers like this, wiggle the cars and drop it right in. However, do not lose these because they only give you two in each locomotive. And until Lionel hopefully puts them on the website, you are going to be SOL. However, I did find another company, which I'm sure you've heard before, um, especially if you're into these early locomotives like I am, called SMR Trains. They have gone out of business. However, their website does have a few products still on it. One of those products are pins and links for Lincoln pin couplers that are O-gauge. So if you know you're going to lose these, you might want to hop on that website and pick up a couple of sets. They're not super expensive, and it's always good to have extras. All right, everybody, now we are on to the passenger cars for the 119. Both of these cars aesthetically on the outside are identical, so I will only go over one. The only difference being is the number. This is number 29, and the car behind it is 150, and I am assuming for the 150th anniversary of the Golden Spike. These cars, to my knowledge, are the actual same molds as the Lincoln Funeral Train cars. However, I will tell you, if you don't know, they are plastic. I was under the impression that they were brass cars as well, but kind of makes sense, they're a little bit lighter. These locomotives don't have a lot of pulling power because of how small they are, so it only makes sense. Now there are two cars in each set. The lead car here actually has the legacy rail sounds in it, so it has the chuffing, the whistle, the bell, the whole shebang, um, and the car behind it supposedly, from what Lionel advertised, has an interior. However, I have not opened up the car to verify that, but it is kind of difficult to see through the windows because the windows are kind of like an opaque type of shade looking thing. But I can kind of see stuff inside, but not very clearly, but I will eventually open one up just to, you know, satisfy my own curiosity. So on all the passenger cars in both sets, you are going to have the railroad's name across the top. It's very, very clean, very, very crisp, very nicely applied, as well as the number with some more artwork and pinstriping. What I love on these cars is the end hand railings and you can kind of, let me shift the camera over a little bit, you can kind of see it on this rear car. They're so dainty and ornate and they're just, they're fancy looking and I absolutely love it and you even have some more on the side here. You have some nice red trim around the windows as well as the trucks. The trucks are die cast metal and the passenger cars do not light up. I think I'm not 100% certain I think I remember reading that they said the cars were going to illuminate and I got them and it turns out they didn't it's not the end of the world I could always put some type of a small LED in there if I want but I try and think to myself this is the 1860s everything's lit with oil lamps or candles so it's not going to be the end of the world if it doesn't have lights in it so that's it for the passenger cars and the 119 we are now going to go on to the Jupiter Alrighty, here it is, the Central Pacific Jupiter and my personal favorite locomotive because I am a sucker for the balloon and diamond stack style locomotives. Same thing as the 119, it is a die cast metal and brass build with many turned brass um, accents and details. You have 
that beautiful printing on the cab that actually emulates the wood grain, as well as a nice clean and crisp Jupiter name across the bottom of the cab. The headlight has this wonderful scroll work and artwork on it. Just looks great, an LED headlight, so it does light up when the locomotive is running. They both have magnetically opening boiler front uh, doors, and the number plates are actually brass with the number 60 on the Jupiter and the 119 on the Union Pacific. You have your brass crosshead pump, die cast metal side rods, wheels, and you do have some gold pinstriping and leaf work on the sand dome, as well as the bell lanyard that both locomotives have, turned brass bell and a turned brass steam dome. Now, what I do like on the Jupiter um, is the headlight bracket on the real one, the way they're cut, you can actually see through like the wrought iron on it. They emulated that as best as they could, but they couldn't make it obviously see through like the model, but I actually will zoom in on that so you guys can appreciate that. The one thing that did kind of bug me a little bit with this is these boiler stanchions on the front. Dude, they're freaking plastic. Like I thought these were gonna be metal, but they're plastic. Look how they bend, especially this one. This one's warped to hell over here. But that's me being picky once again. I can't be that picky <laughs> because of what these things are. You have a operating um, Lincoln pin bar for the front of the locomotive. If you were to say you ever wanted to double head these, which I can't see that happening a lot. Now we're gonna shift to the tender so you guys get a better close up view of that. All right, here's the back of the Jupiter. This is your cab interior. As you can tell in here, you have your fireman controls. Um, you have your sight glasses. You have a throttle, painted gauges on the top. And this is the other thing I love. I love on the Jupiter, these little porthole windows. I just think they're so cool looking. This also has the big cover, I guess, like I said earlier for the um, gearing for the locomotive. Not the end of the world, like I said, you, can, you can't really see into the cabs very well anyway, so it's not gonna be a deal breaker. And then here is your hookup for the Lincoln pin. Yes, not only the passenger car is coupled together with a Lincoln pin, the locomotive does as well. And it is a very tight gap. Obviously use a pair of tweezers if you can to plug in your connection wire to your tender, and you can drop your pin in and you'll be good to go. Here's the tender on the Central Pacific Jupiter. The artwork and the paint on this is astonishing as well. Um, I love the muted colors like I stated before. I think they bring a little bit more of a level of realism and authenticity to the locomotive. Each locomotive has its respected loads in it. The 119 has a realistically separately applied coal load and the Jupiter has a wood load in the top of it. Also, I did forget to mention that on the tops of the locomotives, which box is it? It's this one. They do have magnetic tops and these have your run program switches underneath. So if you guys are looking for that, that's where they are on the locomotives. And on the passenger car, they are on the bottom. The sound cars are the first cars behind the locomotive. And actually when you enter them into your legacy remote, you actually have to have the sound car as well as the locomotive on the car and you program them all at the same time to work in conjunction. So back to the tender on the Jupiter. Like I said, all this wonderful scroll work the paintwork is nice and crisp and clean, um, as well as some more pinstriping down here. Now, what I did have when this thing arrived is the brake shoes underneath here. I thought these were brass. These are actually plastic, and these were kind of warped, and they were pressing against the wheels, so it was having a very hard time moving. So just check yours when you get them. They might be pressing against the wheels. You can actually unscrew them and pull them off and kind of you know stretch them out and bend them a little bit so that they're not rubbing against the wheels. The tender on the Jupiter um, is actually loaded with nice artwork as well. They're more of like designs and stuff. So you have some more here on the front of the water bunkers. Then on the back of the tender, you have the number 60 with more pinstriping detail and coloration. And it's A plus all the way around for all the graphics and decoration on these locomotives. All right, and this is the passenger car set for the Jupiter. However, you can tell the cars are two different styled cars, so I will go in and go over each one of them. All right, this is the first car, and this is the car with the legacy rail sounds inside of it. You have Central Pacific Railroad of California with some more scrolling and leaf work up here. You have a big circular nameplate in the middle, and it's called Silver Palace, and this is the sleeping car. This is number 18, and then the 
Second car in the set is number 69, and it indicates 1869, the year that the Transcontinental Railroad was completed. So a nice little Easter egg there. Diecast metal trucks and wheels. These cars are the exact same models as the Union Pacific ones, just the paintwork and the detail is a little bit different. Like I said, that's the lead car with all the sounds, but I think personally my favorite car is the immigrant car, which I'm going to show you right now. This is the immigrant car. Very, very simple, very, very Spartan, as would be the types of cars that would carry, you know, Chinese laborers, Irish laborers, whoever. Both railroads did have immigrant cars. They just chose to model it with the Central Pacific Railroad. It says Central Pacific Railroad of California, California being abbreviated. Immigrant car, number 69, which is 1869, which completes the little hidden Easter egg, die-cast metal trucks. I do like, however, how these trucks are like that Pullman green color. The Pullman green with the brown, it's a very mute and subdued color scheme, but it just looks absolutely phenomenal. Now I'm going to run each locomotive and its cars individually. I will go over the sounds. Both of the sound sets on the locomotives, meaning the whistles and the bells and the chuffing and stuff, are absolutely identical. The only thing that does differ is the cab chatter, as one will say east and one will say basically west. But I'm going to go over those now. The first locomotive I will run will be the 119 and her passenger cars. Alrighty guys, here's the Union Pacific 119. I will do the startup sequence, I will go through some of the sounds, and then I will show you guys some videos of it running. Please excuse the backgrounds now. We actually moved, I'm temporarily in a garage, so my workshop is set up for that. Um, so it's not gonna be as elegant as, as it normally is until we can get into a house and I build a bigger layout, but enough talking. I know you guys wanna see the train, so here we go. This is the dispatcher, do you copy? Acknowledged. Over. Start up and get ready to move. Over. Yes, sir. Start up and stand by. Out. Okay, so the first sound I'm going to do is the bell. It actually has a nice sound of like a hand rung bell because there's kind of inconsistency in the hits. And I can also do the single hits because it is legacy, so. Next up is the whistle. Now these locomotives in the 1860s, most of them had single chime whistles, so it is a very plain whistle and it is very, very high pitched. I actually had a gentleman that was mentioning to me that the whistle on the locomotive is a little bit out of tone, I guess you wanna say. I don't really mind it. I mean, I do notice that if you get up into the higher levels of the whistle sound, it does get a little bit screechy almost but I'm not an expert on these locomotives, so that could be an accurate thing. But anyway, here we go, this is the whistle. Me personally, I like to keep it at a very low level because I think it sounds the best. So in my opinion, that's probably the best tone because when you go to the max, it's a little bit kind of digitally, but not the end of the world. So you have the tower talk. So this is the tower communicating with the locomotive. Dispatcher here, you're clear to pull, over. Copy that, dispatcher, I'm green, out. And then this is the locomotive commuting with the tower. Dispatcher, station work complete, ready to head west, can I pull? Roger that. Take the green. Over. Copy that, dispatcher. I'm green. Out. Now, obviously, you said it was clear to her uh, to head west. The Union Pacific built from the east coast to the west, and the Central Pacific built from the west coast to the east. So each locomotive will have its corresponding destination travel, you know, direction. So you have your water fill sound. Obviously, the longer you hold the button, the longer the sound you will go for. And you have your blowdown. And I don't know if you guys heard that because I did the blowdown a little bit soon, but as you let go of the water fill, you'll actually hear them confirm that the water tanks are full. 
So now we're gonna do some running so you guys can actually appreciate the thing in motion. Just so you know, this locomotive and these cars are actually rated for 036 curves. I happen to have 036 curves, so I am at the bare minimum for these locomotives and cars. However, they will definitely look better on a wider curve. But I'm going to do the um, sequence so that it will do all the bells and whistles and all that fun stuff on its own. So I'm going to do that by pressing and holding the aux one key until I hear the bell ring twice and one toot of the whistle. And we're ready to go. So two to roll out. This is the Central Pacific Jupiter, so I'm going to go through some of the sound functions and stuff like that. All the sounds are essentially the same as the 119 with the exception of some of the tower com, but here we go. This is a dispatcher. Do you copy? Copy that. Over. Please start up and stand by. Over. Yes, sir. Start up and stand by. Out. All right, so the first sound up is the bell. Next up is the whistle. Next up is the water filling up the tender. Now we have our blowdown. And then finally we have our locomotive chatter. Engine to dispatcher. There's up and the crew's on board. Are we clear? Roger that. Take the green. Over. Thank you much. All clear moving to the outbound. Out. Now I'm going to try and get it to say heading um, east, but I might have to cycle through a couple of sounds, so we're going to see what we can do here. Engine to dispatcher. The wood bunker is full. Ready to make our pull. Can we get permission to occupy the main? Roger that. Take the green. Over. Thank you much. All clear. Moving to the outbound. Out. Tower. Station work complete. Ready to head west. Can I pull? Negative. Please hold. Over. Copy that. Holding on the ready. Out. Oh, 
there you go. We got it to say west. I know it does say east because it did cycle through that at one point, but I'm not going to torture you guys with all the tower comm sounds and <laughs> go through it all again. So if you guys get it, you can uh, go through and find it yourself. So now we're going to do some run bys and let you guys see the locomotive in action. All right, guys, now I'm going to activate sequence control. That works by holding down the aux one key for a few seconds. You're going to hear the bell ring twice and the whistle blow once. All right, and away we go. Alrighty guys, and that's it for the Golden Spike locomotives. This is a wonderful set. Lionel did a fantastic job with these. They list at around $1,300 per locomotive, something around that. Different dealers may have them a little bit cheaper. However, I do suggest if you are interested in these, you should have pre-ordered them or try and hunt them down ASAP because once these are gone, you will most likely never see these again. The passenger car sets range around $359 to $400 for each two car set. There also is a two car add-on set that you can buy of just generic Woodruff sleeping cars that have no sound or anything like that. Like I said, Lionel, I can't say enough good things. These locomotives are beautiful. I hope to see more of this turn of the century stuff down the road. Um, that's it guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, give it a like and a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe because Next video, I will be doing a review on some of my uh, custom Disneyland Railroad locomotives as well as a custom Back to the Future train. Thanks for watching, guys.